Hello, this is Albert van Dijk, and uh, this is the uh, third video on uh, the use of remote sensing for uh, atmospheric applications. So previously we looked at weather forecasting, severe weather warning, uh, and air pollution. And in this video, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the use of satellite remote sensing for climate research, and particularly looking at uh, global warming. <clears throat> so um, you may have seen uh, uh, reports or, or documents that use a combination of uh, ground station measurements of uh, temperature changes and compare those or extend those with satellite measurements and that's quite doable because we can measure the, uh, the, the uh, temperature of the surface and also the temperature of the atmosphere uh, uh, reasonably well uh, with uh, remote sensing as we've seen in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in another video for, for instance using atmospheric sounding. So in this graph here you see uh, a plot right up to 2010 uh, and uh, uh, that could be extended of course uh, we see the temperature normally uh, of the atmosphere uh, compared to uh, a baseline level. Uh, so basically you see the, the global warming. Uh, and you, you can see that the surface measurements uh, with, at stations, climate stations around the world in blue, uh, agree quite well with the satellite measures uh, here in, uh, in uh, uh, green and red. They basically represent two different ways of, uh, of uh, processing microwave remote sensing data to get, to get temperature records. Uh, and as you can see, there is obviously uncertainty depending on how you process them, but the overall trend is very close. And, uh, and so we can use this technique to get a good estimate of global average temperature, uh, which uh, in effect probably better than using only ground-based data because we don't have stations everywhere, for instance, out in the, ocean, in the oceans and in remote areas. Uh, of course, uh, an important component of the uh, whole global war warming um, effect is the uh, is the insulation of the earth uh, with by co2 so it essentially it affects the radiative uh, balance of the atmosphere and that's of course radiation is what we measure typically with remote sensing so uh, here's a, a, a diagram that shows you the main components of the uh, radiation the incoming solar radiation some of it being absorbed some of it being uh, in the atmosphere some of it absorbed by the land uh, the rest of it reflected uh, back into space, if you like, uh, and, uh, and some of it reflected out into space from cloud tops and so forth. And of course, the uh, the important part of the global warming process is is the uh, long wave radiation balance. So you see the uh, the long wave radiation, or let's say often infrared radiation, mostly infrared radiation being emitted by the Earth. Uh, some of that uh, uh, reaching the, uh, the the top of the atmosphere and going into outer space. Uh, some of it being absorbed again. By the atmosphere and hence warming the atmosphere uh, and, and that is where CO2 and other greenhouse gases play, play their uh, most important role. And so we can measure me several of these components with remote sensing. For instance we can measure the reflectance of the surface and that's what you see here. Uh, you see the uh, clear sky albedo um, which is essentially the albedo if there's no cloud or haze and then we said total sky albedo which is a better measure of the actual uh, albedo uh, of the surface and albedo being the, the fraction of the visible light being reflected by the surface. So the reflectivity, but not in a narrow band, but in a broader sort of visible range uh, band. In fact, uh, in, in the range of the, uh, the solar radiation. So wh why are these two different? Well, the, the easiest thing to think about is if you think of a shadow, if the sky is clear, the shadows are sharp and crisp, uh, and there's, uh, there's very little radiation coming from those shadows, but if the uh, if the if it's overcast, then the shadows are much less, or even disappear. Uh, and of course, from those shadow uh, areas, there is still radiation being received and reflected. So uh, for that reason, the uh, the total sky albedo, which takes into account things like cloud and haze, uh, is uh, typically higher than the uh, clear sky albedo. And in this picture, you see the differences of different uh, surfaces in terms of albedo. So I apologize for the, uh, the scale having been lost here, but essentially. Uh, this would be in the order of uh, so normal uh, water will be in the, uh, less than 0 0.1, uh, so 10% reflection, uh, and then as you go through uh, through uh, vegetation surfaces around 20 or a bit more, uh, through uh, dry deserts maybe 30, and then so 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90%, uh, you start to see snow, and so you know, if you like dirty snow with all the snow with soot versus a very new clean. Uh, uh, very white snow. 
And here you see the same sort of deal for, for clouds, which will, of course, also look pretty white from space. Uh, and that's, of course, important because whatever's reflected back into space doesn't contribute to the Earth's uh, radiation balance. And so, uh, for instance, uh, you know, the loss of, uh, of uh, ice caps is not only an issue in terms of uh, sea level rise, but also an issue in terms of the changing uh, radiation balance of the Earth. You can also measure uh, the atmospheric moisture content, as we've seen in the previous uh, uh, video, and, and here's just a, 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 an integrated example of that over one year, I believe, uh, it might have been 2007, where you see the amount of uh, vapor in the air, and there's you know, some features that you see in blue, there's more vapor than in red, so, so you can see cold air can hold less moisture, uh, as you probably know, and also you know, the higher the altitude, the lower the air pressure and, and the lower the amount of air above the surface, uh, you know, going to, towards the top of the atmosphere, and so there's less vapor uh, in the atmosphere there. And, and of course, that's what you see here is both and dry and very high and very cold, so you have very low uh, vapor pressures or vapor um, uh, uh, amount of vapor in the atmosphere. And so um, these things are important because there's a, a, a relatively simple relationship between water vapor in the atmosphere and rainfall in the sense that the more water vapor is in the atmosphere, the, m the more li the likelihood of rain typically. That's a, that's a reasonably well, uh, a reasonably strong relationship. So from remote sensing and from other missions, we know that atmospheric water vapor is increasing, uh, certainly over the oceans, uh, over land it's a bit less obvious, uh, and uh, that therefore we should get higher rainfall. And indeed that's what we, we do get, again particularly over the oceans, uh, and that's the process uh, that we uh, refer to as water cycle intensification. Of course, that propagates through the whole water cycle. So more rainfall means more runoff. Uh, typically, uh, can mean uh, more snow in particular areas. Uh, can mean um, uh, more groundwater, uh, more soil moisture, and so forth. Uh, but as I said, you know, a lot of the increased rainfall actually happens uh, over the surface, and that's uh, that's that's what you see here. You see the um, uh, the uh, uh, increase in water vapor over the oceans um, uh, and, uh, and the trend line. As you can see, there is a trend, but there's also a lot of variability. All right, the final uh, uh, sort of application or, or relevant thing to talk about is, is ice. So we, we can quite easily use a number of different remote sensing methods to measure a sea ice extent. And that's what you see in this graph here. You see the annual minimum area of sea ice from 1979 right down to 2012. And if I was to uh, plot this, this is for the Arctic, so the North Pole, then this would go down even further. It's, uh, it's quite alarming how rapidly sea ice is, is disappearing there. So uh, you can look at it as a graph, uh, but this uh, image here uh, also shows you the same thing uh, in terms of where the ice is gained and lost from year to year. And as you see quite clearly, um, you can track the uh, the uh, the loss of ice, sea ice, uh, over the uh, over this um, thirty year period. And as I said, if you were to extend this, it doesn't get any better. In fact, it gets quite a bit worse in more recent years. All right. Well, that's uh, the the um, the uh, ch the changing ice caps, if you like. But of course, we might also want to know what is the the, the land ice, what is it doing? And that's what you see in, in this image here. You see uh, uh, the radar backscatter over this uh, this uh, piece of uh, ice, in, uh, ice cap in Canada. Uh, and you can start to use the backscatter characteristics to map out the age of the ice. So what we see here in dark colors uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, relatively new ice and snow and so on. And, uh, and in the whiter colors, so the more backscatter uh, we get the, uh, the multi-year ice, so the, the, the aging ice. And we can use that and we can track it over time uh, and classify it as is done in this image here and, uh, and, and look at whether that age structure of the ice is changing and therefore what, what, is the, what the dynamics of the ice caps are. Alright, well that was uh, a short video on some of the uses uh, of uh, satellite remote sensing to better understand global warming uh, and, uh, and our global climate.